Welcome everybody to Go Local Live. I'm Josh Fenton, CEO and co-founder. I want to first thank Jennifer Lawless, the chair of the political science department at the University of Virginia, who had just joined us a little earlier. But I want to go over to Dr. Richard Goldberg, uh, a well-known physician at the Warren Alpert School of Medicine at Brown University, but also sort of has uh, taken his career into being uh, uh, a little bit of a Sherpa in, in the world of golf and has written a, a very intriguing book about sort of how to extend yourself in the play. Dr. Goldberg, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here, thank you. Okay, so tell us, start with this book, but also tell us how you got to this book, not the normal path. We've probably interviewed 100 members of the Brown faculty, probably 50 from Warren Alpert, um, not many, you know, they're usually talking about brain science or, or dementia. Not many are talking about golf. Yeah, well, I, you know, I was always an avid golfer. And when I was playing golf, this started probably 12 years ago. Typically on the first tee, somebody would say to me, oh, so you're a psychiatrist. You're going to read my mind today? And I would say to them, uh, well, I don't have to do that because by the fourth hole, you're going to tell me everything you're thinking anyway. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, people started just talking to me about what was going on in their head when they were playing golf. And I started to realize that it was a mess. <laughs> you know, people thought they were thinking, but mostly they were worrying. <laughs> and so I started to, uh, you know, write things down, be a little more systematic, uh, and I found out that, of course, I had the psychiatry skills. I knew how to change, help people change behavior. So I started to uh, kind of slowly coach people and it caught on. And more people started calling me with things. Uh, and as I accumulated my experience, I wrote things down. And this book emerged, Better Golf, Better Life. Uh, so talk a little bit about. Um, as an athlete, I've, I've never really played golf. Um, I've always played, uh, I played lacrosse for a tremendously long period of time, probably too long. I played tennis. And, and in lacrosse, the, you always feel most empowered when what, what is called the game slows down, that you kind of see everything, feel everything almost before it happens. You're in kind of complete control, regardless of you're running full speed and someone is trying to hit you. Um, uh, in golf, it's a much more mental game, right? You're not reacting, for the most part, to other external forces. It's you, your club, and the ball. How is it that people's control of that situation becomes so skewed? Yeah, because people can't focus themselves, you know, is a big problem. I mean, yeah. just try standing over a golf ball. You're not reacting to something the way you are in lacrosse or tennis. You are creating from a static spot uh, a very complex, highly orchestrated physical, mental, emotional event. And a lot of times people get off track because uh, emotions sneak in. You know, I'm not going to hit this very well, or I missed this last time, or I hope I look good in front of these other people, or <laughs> where should my right elbow be, or, you know. Everything is there to interfere. So it's, uh, you know, they say golf is 90% mental. And the great Bobby Jones said golf is played on the field uh, the five inches between your ears. Yeah, right. And, and there's a reason that every single PGA pro and every serious player has a mental golf coach on their team. And, and what's the separation? What is that? I don't mean to oversimplify your analysis, your expertise, your medical degree, uh, and decades of experience. But what, if you're going to point to something, what separates the winners from the losers? Well, when they've asked uh, top PGA players, what's the number one problem that's, that makes you a better player than me? They, they say it's the ability to focus. Yeah. So a, a great player will say to an aspiring player, the difference between you and me is not how far we hit the ball, not how good, not how good we putt, not our ball striking. You lose your concentration four or five times more every round than I do, and over a four, a, you know, a tournament to four rounds, that's 16 strokes right there. 
And is that in part due to consumption of alcohol during the, the, during the play? <laughs> Um, you know, that actually sometimes helps people. But, you know, it's a little, it's very personal. personal. <laughs> yeah. uh, doctor, talk a little bit about the process of writing the book and then what golfers have, have told you in feedback after them utilizing your expertise in reading the book. Yeah, well, I wrote book, I wanted to do, the book is 34 kind of bite-sized chapters because I didn't think anybody wants to sit down and go through, you know, heavy text. So it's sort of, you know, sections on, you know, the fundamentals of you know, focus and concentration and tempo and equanimity. You know, there are some technical things, and but then there's also some, you know, I was struck by how inspirational and transformational golf can be for people. There's people who, they live their life for this game. There's something there that you know is greater than themselves. The beauty, the uh, a sense of gratitude for being in a beautiful place and being able to participate in this. So I wrote down, you know, these musings that are, that were meant to be helpful to people. Some are inspirational, some are instructional, uh, and people give me the feedback that they like these bite-sized pieces. They find a number of chapters that really help them and they read them over and over, uh, which is nice to hear. Uh, so the message about we play golf to be better people, not just better golfers, was, you know, I was wondering whether that would work because everybody just wants to hit the ball farther and shoot a lower score. So in, sure. in, in, but, in, in golf, there's the folklore that Tiger Woods' father would would construct situations where he'd pay Tiger's uh, opponents to cheat in front of Tiger, and uh, and uh, you know uh, whether on on score counting or on playing a ball or whatever, in order to get in Tiger Woods' head so that he could learn how to block it out and go about his own business. This was when he was you know sub teenager supposedly. Right. It, it, okay. is, is part of it just controlling your own emotions, your own sort of cutting out everything else, just you, the club, the ball? Yeah, well, Tiger famously had the strongest mind in golf. You know, his mother was a Thai Buddhist and taught yeah. him meditation from an early age. And you're right, his father used to do things to, uh, cr you know, crash metal cups together while he was swinging <laughs> right. to, you know, to train him. But, you know, I have people who have, uh, you know, I was just working with a woman who was trying to win her state amateur championship, and she got knocked off in the semifinals every year by a woman who was kind of playing mind games with her, you know, yeah. on, the, on, on the excuse of being a good sport, was saying things. So it wasn't just a matter of learning to focus, and she had to work out some, you know, kind of psychological issues about why it was okay for her to beat an older woman. <laughs> you know, was she ready to assume the mantle of being a champion? And you know, that took a little psychological work aside from, it wasn't just cutting this out. Yeah. How did she do? Uh, she eventually won her state. Congratulations. Yeah. Some kudos must go to the coach. Um, uh, what's What's been the biggest surprise in the reaction to the book? And what do you think, if you were to add to it in the next edition or the next book, you think needs to take place? What do you need to communicate? Well, I think one of the things that's, that's come up more is, and that I've found more, there's a culture in golf, which is a problem for people. And that, that culture is, there's always something wrong and there's always something you have to fix. So it makes people go on these endless quests of exactly where their elbow is, where their wrist is, where their foot is, where their, et cetera. Getting tips, one golf tip after another. So this culture that there's something wrong with my swing and I have to fix it is a problem. And I try to get people to a place where they could say instead, there's something going on with my swing, and I need to become aware of it. Now, I, I credit, you know, the, that original statement is from a coach named Fred Shoemaker, who I have tremendous respect for. But it gets people out of the, 
endless sense of always try, feeling they're doing something wrong and have to fix it. And that's not a way to learn. It just makes people feel bad and inadequate. And instead, getting people into a place where they, they can learn to teach themselves to become aware of things in their swing. And as they become aware of these things, um, their swing improves and they play better golf. And it also carries over into their life. They have more of a sense of presence with other people. You know, imagine if a bo uh, an executive at work, someone comes into his or her office and wants to say or complain about something. Imagine if that executive could be present, look the person in the eye, listen to them. Uh, the way they they learn to be present with a you know on the golf course. What what a difference it would make in their life. So that's something I would, uh, you know, help cultivate a little more of this. What's going on in our culture that people are always trying to fix things, look for the quick tip to get things better, and instead kind of learn to cultivate awareness of what's going on, you know, with their golf swing or with their life. And, and that is a key to kind of a self-learning approach. A coach doesn't, I don't tell people what to do with their golf swing or their golf game because they need to become aware of it and be coaching themselves. Dr. Goldberg, uh, give you the last word uh, and the opportunity for a little uh, 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 capitalism. How do people get your book and what should they be expecting from you in the future? Well, it's pretty simple. The book, Better Golf, Better Life is on Amazon. It's also on Audible now. It's also on Kindle, so it's pretty easy to get. So I'd be happy if you know people picked up a copy. Uh, people can give me a call if they're wanted, if they're curious about mental golf and how I can help them. You know, I don't charge people to have a phone call and and help them understand. It's not for everybody. Uh, but my website www.drrichgolf.com is a good place to start, and uh, maybe I can help some people become better golfers and better people. It, it's a lot of fun to work together. It's a great privilege. Uh, doctor, I appreciate you taking the time. We appreciate it. It's a great story. It's a great, it's a great personal story of your transformation and all the things you're doing, building on one skill set to help people with, an, with another issue. Uh, so I, I appreciate it. Uh, for everybody else, stay tuned. As we've talked about earlier today, there is expected to be a major protest on uh, on the Hamas-Israeli uh, war directly across from our headquarters at the Turks Head building at Textron's world headquarters. Providence police have been set up there since about 9 o'clock this morning. Uh, it's supposed to kick off at noon. If it builds, we'll have live coverage of it on Go Local. And for everybody else, stay safe. There's a lot of things taking place today. We'll have updates throughout the day. Uh, enjoy the day, stay warm, and be safe. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Josh.